Welcome to Models of Treatment for Co-Occurring Disorders, brought to you by AllCEUs.com. In this presentation, we're going to identify the main points of relapse prevention therapy. We're going to discuss the theory and purpose of step-down services and identify ways to establish linkages in the community to facilitate the accessibility of wraparound services. There's a lot of jargon for the fact that we're going to talk about how to form a safety net for our consumers, for our patients, once they're discharged so they can get their biopsychosocial needs met. Relapse prevention therapy, main points, there's a lot of them. Recovery and relapse can be described as related to processes that unfold in six stages. First, the person says, time to abstain. So they start detoxing. That takes a couple of days. During that period, they're separating from people, places, and things that promote the use of alcohol or drugs. They've decided they want to get clean, and if they're going through the pain of detoxing, then they're probably wanting to engage on a clean and sober lifestyle. So they start not pushing those people away, but separating themselves. Once the people who used to be their supports, their using supports, are gone, they have to replace that with sober social supports. So it's important early, early, early in recovery for people to establish a social network that supports recovery. That can be a sponsor, that can be AA, that can be church. Ideally, you're going to be involved in activities with people who are in recovery so they can help you see your blind spots and improve your relapse prevention plan. You also will develop social supports and social relationships with people who may not be in recovery, but who are engaging in similar pro-social activities like you are in early recovery, exercising, better nutrition, maybe taking a cooking class at the community college, um, reading at the library, anything where you're involved in a safe place where you're not going to be tempted to be using. Stopping self-defeating behaviors that prevent awareness of painful feelings and irrational thoughts. Stopping the stuffing. Stopping and actually addressing when you're feeling bad and doing something proactive about it. And not setting yourself up for failure. Self-defeating behaviors can include setting goals that are unrealistic. That just gives you an excuse to use. So let's take it one step at a time. Learning how to manage feelings and emotions responsibly. You're going to have icky feelings. You're going to get angry. You're going to get anxious. You're going to be depressed sometimes. It happens. How are you going to manage that without using? Go to a meeting, call a sponsor, go to church, do volunteer work, go out and go bird watching. What works for you? Learn how to change addictive thinking patterns that create painful feelings and self-defeating behaviors. Addictive thinking is very all or nothing. Very extreme. You can go from I got written up at work, so I'm going to lose my job, lose my house, and my kids will never speak to me again. Really? How did you get from here to here that quickly? Chances are you're making mountains out of molehills. You're expecting the worst out of others and yourself. So identifying your stinking thinking patterns and changing mistaken core beliefs about yourself, others, and the world. One of the most common mistaken beliefs is we think people actually pay more attention to us than they do. What I do today, if I make a silly mistake today, people may remember tomorrow, but they're most likely not going to remember two weeks from now. We think that people will remember things forever like we remember them because we were right in the middle of it. Chances are we're not that important in their life. We're not that important for them to focus on our faux pas. Signs of relapse. If you start having mistaken beliefs that cause irrational thoughts, 
Mistaken beliefs like I have to be liked by everybody all the time. Well, that's just not going to happen. So you're setting yourself up for failure. I have to be this. You don't have to be many things. You have to be doing the next right thing. That's what you need to do. Begin to return to addictive thinking patterns that cause painful feelings. Taking one mistake and turning it into I'm a complete failure. Taking one episode and saying, well, I can't help anybody, I'm useless. You might be useless at that particular thing. I can't change a car tire. My daddy showed me how when I was like 16, but I can tell you I can't remember how to do it. I am very capable of calling AAA. We're not all good at everything. And if we expect to be good at everything, we're setting ourselves up. Engaging in compulsive self-defeating behaviors to avoid feelings. You may not be using your drug of choice, but if you are eating yourself into oblivion, gambling, shopping, doing things to escape feelings, we all have to shop eventually. But if you're doing it to escape negative feelings, then it's becoming a compulsive behavior. Seeking out situations involving people who use alcohol and drugs. We can justify why we had to go there. We can minimize the influence they have over us. We can rationalize why we did it. So and so, my old using buddy was really sick, so I went over to try to help him out. Really? Did you bring anybody with you? No. Well, it sounds like you were giving yourself an excuse. Find yourself in more pain, thinking less rationally, and behaving less responsibly. We use to make pain stop. We use to escape. As the pain goes up, we start not really thinking as rationally. We start getting into a fog, and we start doing anything but the next right thing. We want to make the pain stop. Prepare for that. Prepare for things to go hooey. What are you going to do? Go to a meeting. Sit down. Get your wits about you. If nothing else, that is a safe place for you to be until you figure out what the next step is. Or if you find yourself in a situation in which drug or alcohol use seems like a logical escape. If you can create a situation in which you believe alcohol is a logical escape, you've already relapsed. Yes, it is an option. It's always an option. But you know when you take a drink, what happens? You know that if you start, everything else is going to fall apart. Okay, principle one, self-regulation, stabilization. During the detox period, first couple of days, you get the stuff out of your system, but everything else inside is still all hooey. You haven't been eating right, you haven't been sleeping right, and you've been burning up certain neur neurotransmitters faster than anyone could ever hope to make them. Burning up different receptors. You need to give your body a chance to recover, to stabilize again. It's used to having that drug in there. It's gotten stabilized around having that drug. So now you've taken it out, it goes, ooh, I don't know what to do. An example of this in prescription medications are steroids. When my daddy was going through cancer treatment, he was on steroids and he had to slowly be weaned off because the body got used to having that chemical in there, so it quit producing its own. It's important to realize that our bodies are very, very smart and they adapt. They say, oh, okay, that's going to be there forever. We got to figure out how to work with it. So during detoxification and physical stabilization, then we need to help people solve the immediate crises that threaten their sobriety. Psychosocial stabilization. Are they depressed? Are they bipolar? Are they hearing voices? 
Do they have warrants out for their arrest? Are they having family problems? What is it that could distract them from doing the next right thing? Maybe they've already been kicked out of their house and they have nowhere to stay. They're worried their wife is going to leave them and um, the Department of Children and Families is involved with their kids. Well, that's a lot. It's not uncommon, but it's a lot to deal with. You've got to help people figure out what they can impact now and what recovery and doing the next right thing will automatically impact. People need to learn skills to identify and manage post-acute withdrawal and addictive preoccupation. In post-acute withdrawal, people have mood swings. It's expected. You've been numb for a month, a year, a decade. You're going to remember things that you did, things that you didn't do, things that you regretted. You're going to have mood swings. There's going to be times of depression, periods of anxiety. Not sure if you can hack it. Maybe you've already been in recovery a couple of times and you're not sure if you can stay sober this time, but you realize that if you go back out, you're probably going to die. There's a lot to wrap your head around in early recovery. It is not easy and it is not fun. There are parts that can be fun, but there's a lot of stuff that we've got to face and that we've got to deal with. We need to realize that when we start feeling pain, our knee jerk response is going to be to use again. So we'll start obsessing about the good times when we used and how much better it made us feel. We need to have things in place to deal with that. Do you call your sponsor? Do you journal? Do you read in the book, big book? Do you read in your Bible? Do you start knitting? Do you play with your dog? Dogs come up a lot. I think dogs are very therapeutic if you can handle being responsible for another life because they just look at you with these big old eyes and say, it's okay, I'll be with you. All right. You like my dog impression, huh? Let's establish a daily structure that includes proper diet. We need to give the body the building blocks it needs to repair itself. It will tell you what it needs. You'll crave salt. You'll crave spinach. You may hate spinach, and then all of a sudden you're craving it. Well, if you're craving it, try it. Maybe you don't like it cooked, but you like it raw. Tell your doctor what's going on, anything you're craving. Sugar, salt, spices, certain foods. That may help them hone in on certain nutrients that you're lacking. Maybe they can prescribe a multivitamin to help reduce cravings so you're not eating and gaining 30 pounds in the first 30 days. Do know that you'll be hungry because your body's trying to fix itself. It needs those resources. Additionally, if you haven't been eating well, and your body thinks there's a famine outside. It goes, oh, I've only been getting 400 calories and that's all been alcohol every day. So there must be a famine. So my base metabolic rate is gonna slow down. I'm gonna quit burning as much energy because I need to conserve myself. It's not rational. I mean, you can look around and see there's plenty of food, but your body's going, I'm not getting enough, so I'm gonna slow down. When it starts getting more, it says this might be temporary. So your metabolic rate doesn't automatically go right back up. It hangs on for a little while and says, I'm gonna build up some reserves just in case that famine strikes again. Over time, a few months, your metabolic rate will shake out. You won't be craving different things all the time and you'll start to lose weight and stabilize. Your body is trying to protect itself. If it doesn't have enough food, it feeds off itself. It actually feeds off your own muscle if you run out of fat. So I'm really happy if it slows down the metabolism so it doesn't do that stuff. That's sticky. Exercise. I don't mean run a marathon or a mile. Just move your body. Play ball with your dog. See, there's that dog again. Go on a walk. Go to a dog park. Let Fido run around. At least you're up and you're out and you're standing up and getting a little bit of oxygen and sunlight and all kinds of cool stuff. You're probably going to have to go 
fetch his ball or do something for him. So you're going to move. Start small. If you start out too strong and you say, I'm going to go to the gym every day and I'm going to do a spin class and then I'm going to lift weights five days a week. Chances are you're not going to stick with that because part of early withdrawal is also feelings of exhaustion. So between the mood swings and being exhausted because the body's trying to rebuild itself, too much exercise too fast is going to probably backfire. Just move around, gardening, yoga, stretching, doing some sit-ups while you're watching TV in the evening. It doesn't have to be complicated. Matter of fact, keep it simple. Make it not complicated. Stress management, the serenity prayer, time management, identifying what you can handle, separating the must do's from the, well, if I've got times. Things you must do, you must bathe, <laughs> you must sleep, you probably have to go to work. Those are must do's. Picking up your dry cleaning. If you can't do it on Monday, you may have to do it on Wednesday, but that can wait. If it comes to a choice between going, a me going to a meeting and going grocery shopping, you may just have to go out to eat. You've got to learn to prioritize and manage your time. I'm a structured person. I like routines. I like schedules. If that's not you, don't pigeonhole yourself where you're too structured. Make a list of things you've got to get done in a week and slowly work through them. Don't put too much pressure on yourself early. And make sure you have regular contact with treatment, treatment personnel and self-help groups. Treatment personnel are great, but when you're out of treatment, you're going to have to have somebody else to rely on. You can't do it on your own. Principle two is self-assessment. Figure out how you started using. When did this start? When did these behaviors start? When did your coping skills start to fail? What are your critical issues that can trigger relapse? Ask yourself, what are the top five things that might make me kind of throw in the towel and use again? And then figure out how to prevent those or figure out how to deal with them should they occur. And then look at your recovery history and your relapse history, if there is one. Identify what worked. It doesn't matter to me to focus on the stuff that didn't work or that you didn't do because it's still not going to work and you're still not going to do it. What worked? How is life different when you're not using, what are you doing differently? Even if you were only clean and sober for two days, what was different about those two days than two days when you're using? This is what we call increasing exceptions. Try to have that those two days happen more often. Maybe you were involved, maybe your kids were there and you were involved with going to soccer games and going to Walmart or what makes these times different. And then identify your sequence of relapse warning signs. I ask people to tell me when they relapsed and they usually pick a particular date. And I say, no, that's when you used. When did you relapse? When did you start isolating, withdrawing, manipulating, being impulsive, thinking about using? When did all these things start? And they'll think back and find a date. And I say, okay, let's look at a month earlier. Let's think back. If you say you re started having relapse warning signs in February, let's look back to New Year's Day. Were you having any of these signs back then? Generally, they were. When did you stop backing, or when did you stop going to meetings? or at least start backing off from them? When did you stop taking your daily inventory? Some of these may not be relapse warning signs for them, 
but some of them may. Relapse education. Learn accurate information about what causes relapse and what can be done to prevent it. We've detoxed, we've stabilized, we've learned what does it for us, we've learned why probably we started to use and what our relapse warning signs are. Now we have to understand the meta concepts and how to prevent it from happening again. We need to understand how addiction impacts us physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, financially, legally, spiritually, but we also need to understand how recovery impacts us in all those areas. Where addiction may hurt us in all those areas, recovery will build us up. Every positive thing you do in any area positively impacts every other area. Identify common stuck points in recovery. Anniversaries. Maybe the person is only, they've been in recovery three times. This is their third. The first two times they only made it six months and then they relapsed. That's going to be a stuck point. That's going to be their obstacle where they say, I don't know if I can get past that six month mark. The first 30 days is usually a challenge for a lot of people. They do the first 30 days, they're feeling good, they're feeling that pink cloud, they get overconfident, they start withdrawing from meetings, saying, well, I did it for 30 days, I've got this lit. Not so much. Identify complicating factors in relapse, mental health issues, life. Life is a complicating factor, things happen. So what is your drop back and punt? What is your plan B if something happens that you weren't planning for? What are your warning signs? What do you do when you start feeling or seeing these warning signs and how do you prevent them? And how do you create an effective recovery plan? Effective recovery plans involve sober social supports. They involve going to meetings and engaging in activities that promote clean, sober fun. They involve leisure. They involve exercise. They involve health promoting behaviors. You need to be balanced. If you start getting imbalanced, then you're going to start having problems. Self knowledge. Okay. So now we've got the meta concepts. Now we need to figure out ourselves. What are our warning signs? Write down the list of all of your warning signs. And it's probably going to be pretty lengthy. Make an initial warning sign list. These are the ones that start, when I start feeling kind of hinky, these are the, what, the things I do. Analyze this list and pare it down to the top 10 or 15. If you're looking for everything, then you're always going to be hypervigilant and that's going to wear you out. If depression is a warning sign, be aware of it. But when you get depressed, don't assume that you're relapsing. Depression is a natural feeling. It's what you do with it. You nurture that depression or start withdrawing and go into a pit of depression. That's going to be a problem. Develop individualized warning sign lists by thinking of your irrational thoughts. If all of a sudden you start being plagued by shoulds, I should do this, I should do that, or I could have done that better. The only thing you can change is the present. We can learn from the past. We can make amends. We can do our best in the present, which is going to have a positive effect on the future, but we can't predict the future. So you might as well focus on the here and now. Identify two different types of warning signs. Those that are related to your core psychological issues. You always needed approval from your mother or you never felt like you were cool or accepted. And those related to core addictive issues, problems from the addiction. Warning signs resulting from the addiction can include not managing your money very well, hanging out with people who didn't, um, who use drugs, who didn't support a clean, sober lifestyle, 
What are addictive behaviors? Core psychological issues such as trying to get approval from everybody. That relates to stuff from your past. Your past made you who you are. You can learn from it. But now, as an adult, you can say, do I have to be approved by such and such? Do I have to have everyone's approval all the time? Hopefully you can say no. If not, you probably need to go back and look at some of the irrational thoughts again. When a pattern of addictive thinking that justifies relapse is reactivated, then you're going to return to using. What does that mean? That means a relapse starts long before you pick up. Once you engage in that stinking thinking and those addictive behaviors, it won't be long before you start using again. Principle five, coping skills. So you've identified what your stuff is. You've got sober social supports. You've got a relapse plan, um, relapse prevention plan in place. So now you need to learn how to manage or cope with warning signs as they occur. You manage them in three distinct levels. The situational or behavioral level means you avoid situations that trigger warning signs. Don't drive past your dealer's place. But you learn how to modify your behavioral responses when needed. If you have to ride the bus that goes past your dealer's house, how do you modify your response so you don't get off and go to your dealer's house or start obsessing about using? Some people use a rubber band on their wrist and they snap it. Some people say the serenity prayer. You need to figure out what's going to work for you when you encounter these situations. Situations such as holidays, huge triggers for many, many people. You can't avoid your family for every single holiday, henceforth and forevermore, most likely. So how are you going to deal with your overly critical Aunt Susie or your Uncle Bob who is drinking while he's watching beer, drinking, <laughs> drinking beer while he's watching football despite the fact that he knows that you're in recovery. How are you going to deal with these stressors? Then you take the cognitive or affective thought, your thoughts and feelings. Challenge irrational thoughts. I must do this. I can't do that. It's these extreme ways of thinking that can get us into trouble. We need to learn how to deal with unmanageable, unmanageable feelings. They're going to happen. And finally, the core issue. So we've dealt with the behaviors and the situation. We've eliminated it when possible and figured out how to deal with it if we can't eliminate it. We've addressed our thinking and our feeling about the situation and about the drugs and about the person. Now we need to identify the core issue. What is it that initially created the warning signs? What is at the core of this? What are you wanting or needing or craving? Love, attention, approval, some sense of control, Interesting thing, most people's anxieties, resentments, and things that lead them to feel depressed circle around six basic things. Isolation, failure, rejection, the unknown, loss of control, and death. The more poignant the issue, the stronger the reaction. Principle six is change. We've already talked a lot about recovery planning. This also involves development of a schedule of recovery activities that will help you recognize and manage warning signs as they develop. I am a huge proponent of the daily inventory. You don't have to write it down. I don't journal, never did, never will. But you need to take 10 minutes to sit down in your quiet spot, free of distractions, and say, okay, 
how am I doing today? Recognize and manage warning signs as they develop. If you know you're anxious about something, acknowledge it. You can be anxious. You can work through the feeling. It doesn't have to control you. If you acknowledge you're anxious, then you say, okay, what am I going to do so I'm not stressed out and anxious all day long? Review each warning sign on the final warning sign list and ensure that there's a scheduled recovery activity for each. So if you have this list of 15 things that you commonly do right before you relapse, have two or three alternatives. Instead of withdrawing and getting under the covers and watching Jerry Springer for three days straight without getting dressed, what could you do if you start to feel depressed? What are three things? You can call someone. You can go out for a walk. You need to come up with a list of activities that's meaningful for you. Be aware. See right here it says complete a daily inventory. Monitor your compliance with your program. Make sure that if you're doing 90 and 90, that you hold yourself to that. Maybe on the 57th day, you've got the flu and you can't go to that meeting. Okay. Can you go to an online meeting? Can you talk with your sponsor for an hour and work through a step? There are alternatives that you can do. You need to make sure you have secondary plans in case something happens. A morning inventory is very helpful to plan the day. In our house, we have a family meeting every morning. Both of my kids are homeschooled, so we all sit down and they identify what lessons they've got to get done, what chores they have to get done, and what their goals are for their recreational activities. And my husband and I go through what our tasks for work are for that day and any meetings we have, if we have scouts or church or something else that we've got to go to. So everybody's on the same page and there's no surprises. An evening inventory can be helpful to review progress and problems that occurred during the day. Anything that may still be nagging at you you can address at that point and say, why is this still stressing me out? Or what can I do to change this or fix the situation or how I feel about it? A typical morning inventory asks you to identify three primary goals for the day, create a to-do list, and schedule time for completion of each task. In the evening, you review it, figure out if you completed it. If you did, wonderful, give yourself credit for that. If you didn't, figure out why not. Maybe something came up and you had to bump it down on the priority list. It happens. If you are constantly bumping recovery activities off to do something else, you need to take a look at that though. It's really easy to con ourselves. This is why we have to have significant others involved. Those who see us every day. Those who see us once a week, those who are our sponsors, our temporary sponsors, the people in our home group, we can't recover alone. Our addiction is too strong. Our addiction will blind us to what we should be doing, to, those next, to the next right thing. Significant others can be family members, 12-step sponsors, counselors, and peers. The more psychologically and emotionally help, healthy these people are, the more helpful they will be. If they drain your energy all the time, probably not going to be very helpful. If they're too busy with their own stuff to be able to even notice yours, may not be very helpful. Not to say you want to kick them to the curb, but you need to have people who are emotionally healthy and able to give and take, not just take. The more directly a significant other is involved in the relapse prevention planning process, 
the more likely they are to become engaged in supporting positive efforts and intervening when necessary. If they don't know what you should be doing, they're not going to know when you're not doing it. So involve them in the process. Help them understand why meetings are important. Help them understand why working the steps and talking to your sponsor is important. Help them understand the whys. Why are you doing this for each step? It makes logical sense, and if we can explain it to them, then they're not left to try to figure out meaning on their own and maybe come up with the wrong answer. Relapse prevention plan updating should be done on a monthly basis for the first three months. You're going to learn a lot about yourself in those first three months. Quarterly for the remainder of the first year, because you're going to continue to learn more and twice a year for the next two years. Things change, life changes, situations change. You get promotions, you have babies, there's a death, you get a dog, you move. Things change, so you need to update your relapse prevention plan. Nearly two thirds of all relapses occur during the first six months of recovery. Be vigilant for the first six months, but that doesn't mean month seven you can let your guard down. Less than one quarter of the variables that actually cause relapse can be predicted during the initial treatment phase. So less than 25% are going to be on that initial relapse pre prevention plan. The other 75% of triggers and warning signs, you're going to figure out in the first year or two. Updating a relapse prevention plan involves reviewing the original assessment, reviewing initial warning signs and management strategies, and the recovery plan, incorporating new information, and eliminating activities that are no longer needed. After the first three months, daily meetings may not be required. Some people do daily meetings for the rest of their life. Some people do two meetings a day. If their schedule permits it and it doesn't create an imbalance, some activities don't need to be continued, such as medication. Some people need a short course of medication, but don't need to stay on it forever. Some people don't need medication at all. It's important to assess periodically and say, do I still need to be doing this? Or can I use my energy elsewhere? All that being said, I wouldn't suggest somebody go from 90 and 90 to one meeting a week. Just like I wouldn't suggest they go from residential to one hour a week aftercare. It's going from too structured to too unstructured. Gradually stepping down will slowly let life in on life's terms and will let people identify warning signs and identify obstacles to recovery slowly as they come up. Not a flood, but a trickle. We can deal with the trickle. We can't deal with the dam bursting. Residential care often protects people from the daily stresses of bills, traffic, and dysfunctional others. When they step down to intensive outpatient, they may need to come in every single day and talk about their significant other or their dysfunctional work environment or their bills or their legal issues. That's okay. They're coming back and they're clean and sober. They haven't developed all the skills to deal with the stuff yet. We wouldn't expect that. As they develop stronger coping skills and as life doesn't seem so overwhelming, we step them down or they step themselves down to outpatient once or twice a week and gradually they'll move to aftercare and then just meetings and self-help groups. We need to establish linkages in the community for everybody in recovery. Things that will inhibit recovery or inhibit participation include transportation problems, lack of electricity at home, lack of housing or child care, inability to communicate with others because they don't have a telephone, poor education, 
may keep them from getting the housing that they need or getting the job that they need to pay for the housing and the telephone and the electricity. Legal assistance. I don't want somebody going through recovery and putting their heart and soul in it and then being locked up for a year with a bunch of people who are stinking thinking all the time. People need to have access to good nutrition to keep their bodies healthy so they don't start craving or get in pain or get sick all the time. Pro-social activities. What's out there for people to do where substances or addictive behaviors aren't involved? What employment opportunities are out there for people who may have felony convictions for substance use? What employment opportunities are out there for people in early recovery who may not have worked for six or eight months or years? And where can we help people find affordable clothing that they can wear to work? All of these things are resources that need to be available to help people deal with all the other stresses. These are basics. These are things we usually take for granted. These are things that most of my clients needed. And they needed generally all of them. Paying attention to that and helping them connect with the resources. Don't give it to them. That doesn't teach them how to connect. But make sure the resources are available and help them learn how to work within the system. Resources for these things can be churches. Sometimes they give stipends to pay electric bills once a year. They may have food pantries. They may have clothing places, thrift shops, workforce development. Transportation agencies may have tokens for buses. They may have different programs for people to provide low-cost transportation. United Way Information and Referral, 211. It's everywhere throughout the country. Department of Children and Families. People who are on food stamps, social assistance, need to get hooked up with lots of these same resources. So DCF, or whatever it's called in your state, probably already has a pretty comprehensive list of resources to meet these needs. And where are the 12-step groups? Where are the 12-step groups that are friendly to gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender individuals? Where are the 12-step groups that are welcoming to women with children? Either they provide child care or children are allowed at the meetings. Where are the specialty groups that people can go to if they have dual disorders? We need to have an ongoing list. In summary, relapse prevention therapy involves nine principles. Self-regulation, stabilization, integration, figuring out how this new way of being is going to integrate into your lifestyle, understanding the meta-concepts of addiction and how you are triggered, self-knowledge, identifying your own stuff and your own triggers, coping skills, Figuring out what you have and strengthening those. Don't reinvent the wheel. Make sure you have coping skills to deal with anything that may come up. And if you have coping skills and they start to get overwhelmed, what are you going to do? Everyone's coping skills gets overwhelmed at one point or another. How are you going to deal with it? Who can you lean on? Where can you go? Change, time, time to start changing thinking, changing behaviors, changing attitudes. You need to be aware of your relapse prevention triggers or your relapse triggers and how well you're sticking to your relapse prevention plan. You need to involve significant others that can see what you can't see because your addiction is blinding you to it. And you need to figure out how to maintain a healthy lifestyle that meets your biological needs, your safety needs, and your love and belonging needs. 
Generally, step-down services are necessary to prevent straining the effectiveness of new coping skills. Like I said, initially, Jim Bob may need to come in every single day and talk about the same stuff or what seems to be the same stuff because the coping skills aren't strong enough to help him let it roll off his back or let it go or deal with it. So we need to talk about it and we need to help him strengthen those and figure out how he's going to reapproach the situation. As he does that, as he is more able to live on life's terms without being in crisis, he can gradually step down how much contact he has in the intensive settings. And finally, we need to make sure that there's a safety net out there of wraparound services to assist people in meeting basic needs and reducing stress for things that are vital in their life, medication. You can go to most pharmaceutical websites and find vouchers that people can print out in order to get low-cost medication. Walmart, Publix, figure out what agencies in or businesses in your area might have a list of $4 or low-cost prescriptions or how people can get their medication affordably. Where the food pantries are, where the clothes closets are, where they can get donated goods. These are all essential basic needs that most of us take for granted that many of our consumers will need. In order to help them prevent relapse, we need to make sure they're at least meeting their basic, their foundation needs, and gradually ease them back out into life. <laughs>